Good morning. Once again, it is good to see each and every one of you here, and what a blessing it is that we can gather once again on this great day, the Lord's Day, come together and study His precious Word. We are going to continue this morning looking at the theme in which we started last Sunday, and as I mentioned, it's going to be the theme for most of the Sunday mornings throughout this year, if not all of them where we look at the entitled theme of fundamentals. In other words, those foundational building blocks, the milk of the scripture, if you will, that is there for the uplifting and growing of each of us to build upon that which is deeper and greater. We remember, as we saw last week, what Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and verse 22, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. It is that pure spiritual milk, that fundamental or foundational aspects or doctrines of God's word that are necessary to grow up into salvation, to mature as we should, to develop in our life as is necessary. And it is good, as Peter would say, uh, in first and second Peter for us to be reminded of these things to remember those foundational ideas now last week we looked at, uh, at the fund fundamental aspect of creation from Genesis chapter 1 uh, if there is anyone else who would like those notes let me know several have asked for those uh, my notes on that if you would like that let me know today however we're going to be looking at the idea of Bible authority. <clears throat> By that I mean the authority that is deserved, granted, and should be uh, recognized concerning God's holy writ. Now, over the years, there has been, unfortunately, a lost definition concerning the word authority and the Bible in particular. And by that I mean there has been a loss of this fundamental aspect wherein Bible study, as we talk about next week, is required. So many have, because of a lack of teaching on it or a lack of desire to know about it, so many are lacking in their maturity in faith and in their Bible study because they don't understand the power of biblical authority, where it lies and how it's established. It's unfortunate that so many today are like those of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Instead of needing the meat of God's word are still needing the spiritual milk of it. That though by this time, he says, you ought to be upon the meat, the mature things, you need the milk. And the, that problem lies strictly and completely uh, in a recognition of Bible authority. And so we're going to begin, as I said, before we get to next week and looking at Bible study, we're going to look at what is fundamental and required to study the Bible, to be able to take those things that are the pure spiritual milk and grow thereby in them. And so in today's lesson, I hope to bring us back to remembrance what Bible authority is and how to ascertain Bible authority and the fundamentals of that. In the Bible, we see one of the most important verses of all the scripture concerning authority in Colossians chapter 3, in verse 17, where we read, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. <clears throat> now, when we look at this, as you and I have talked about plenty of times and studied plenty of times, this particular passage is saying whatever we do, whatever we, uh, in word or deed, our actions and our words, they are bound by the name of the Lord or Jesus's God's authority. But where is that authority established? That authority is established 
within the word of God. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at our first point this morning. What is it that really motivates, recognizes, and builds the foundation of Bible study? Concerning Bible authority, it is the fact that the Bible is inspired. But what does that word inspired mean? What does it mean to have something that is uh, in, uh, inspiration? Excuse me. <clears throat> Easton's Bible Dictionary would say this concerning inspiration, that extraordinary or supernatural divine influence vouchsafed to those who wrote the Holy Scriptures, rendering their writing infallible. If you were to look up the word inspiration in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, you would find this. The biblical books are called inspired as the divinely determined products of inspired men. The biblical writers are called inspired as breathed into by the Holy Spirit so that the product of their activities transcends human powers and becomes divinely authoritative. Inspiration is, therefore, usually defined as a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God, by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. In other words, inspiration, when we talk about the Bible being inspired, what we're talking about is that which is breathed out by God. It's good to have those who would give us definitions like this, but the Bible is always its best definer, isn't it? And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, we read this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, uh, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The ESV would say of this particular passage, all scripture is, noticed breathed out by God. That word inspiration there in the New King James and King James literally means to be breathed out by God. Again, when we talk about the Bible being inspired, what we're talking about is that God literally, vocally, made the Bible through human beings. In other words, they only spoke or wrote what God told them. <laughs> the Bible, therefore, and why we call it such, is God's word. It's unfortunate that <clears throat> some, there's always going to be those who don't believe in the Bible, obviously, who don't believe in God. Those are fools, the Bible says. But it's more unfortunate in many ways for those, <clears throat> I have a family member or family members who think this way, that yes, there is a God, and yes, uh, the Bible is from him in a sense, but God allowed men to write it, and so it's really only man's opinion. Now, those ideas don't mix, I, I grant it, and it's not logical or reasonable. And anyone who does that is doing that simply because they might not like what God says, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And so if all you have to do is say, well, man really wrote it. Yeah, yeah, there's a God, but man really wrote it. Therefore, I don't have to follow it. <clears throat> but when we look at this, Paul clearly declared that the Bible is God's word. That he breathed out that which we have today. That which we have to study to read, to examine, to scrutinize as the Bereans did. From Genesis through Revelation, we have that which God wanted us to have. 
In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, Paul would say it this way to the church there, who, by the way, questioned his apostleship. He said, these things, these things I've been talking to you about, these things God has revealed to us. Who's us? Those who, have, uh, who are the apostles. He said, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Paul says, listen, the Holy Spirit is searches what God wants him to say. He then comes to Paul or whoever else is inspired, given this revelation. And he, Paul says, then I give it to you. Notice verse 13. And we who have received from the Spirit that which God wants us to say, and we impart in the, this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Paul says, listen, nothing I say, nothing I write down has not been revealed to me by the Spirit. Now, he lets me interpret those truths. I say it in my words. I use my way of saying it, but he makes sure it's perfect in doing so. In other words, the Bible is inspired. But just because Paul says it's inspired, and God says it's inspired, how can we know it's inspired? What is it about the Bible, outside of those direct statements, what is it about the Bible that informs us or lets us have the faith that is required and needed, as we'll talk about in a little bit, to know this is given to us by God. That it's not just 44 or roughly 44 men who wrote it over 1,500 years and someone slapped it together. How can we know it's inspired? First, the Bible was written roughly by 44 different men over 1,500 years, and yet it's perfect with zero contradictions. Listen, I understand there are a lot of people in the world, and they've written lots of books on supposed contradictions. And yet, I've not found one debate where those who would argue against the perfection or inerrancy of God's word have been able to debate anyone and them not being who's got any kind of uh, apologetic background and biblical understanding and been able to hold their argument. By that I mean Today, the world would like you to understand, and Satan wants so many people to think, that those who would claim there are contradictions, again, he wants people to forget what that word actually means. The word contradiction means that there is two passages that cannot harmonize in any form or fashion. That there is zero chance that passage A and passage B that say slightly different things can harmonize in any form or fashion. The problem with that is there's no such thing as that when it comes to the Bible. Every single supposed contradiction has at least one, if not multiple, ways of harmonizing. In other words, no contradiction. Now again, that doesn't necessarily mean we know which one of those, if there's more than one way of harmonizing it, which one it is. If there's three ways of harmonizing it and there's nothing in the scriptures that lend its way one way or the other to that, all we know is that there is no contradiction there that one of these three ways is going to be that which is right. We just simply don't have enough information. But what we do know is there is no contradiction. 
the Bible has done. You won't find anyone, as I said, not a single person who knows how to defend God's word being caught in a quote-unquote contradiction that cannot harmonize it. It does not exist. Now think about that for a minute. <clears throat> there is not a single, and, I, and mind you, not a single antique or ancient writing that we have multiple transcripts of that doesn't have contradictions in it outside of the Bible. Whether it be Hermes or whether it be any of those ancient writings where we have sometimes seven to ten of them all of those have contradictions in them no way of harmonizing and yet we're told we know exactly what he was saying but the bible with 66 different books 44 different authors and over a 1500 year span is just as harmonizing in Revelation 22 as it is in Genesis chapter 1. How can we know the Bible is inspired? <clears throat> Simply at the magnitude of that which was put together and providentially taken care of. Secondly, if the Bible was written solely by men and not by God, and it was written by a group of men in particular, that we're trying, in the New Testament anyways, we're trying to convert Jews to a religion that they knew was a hoax. All right? So if it was the situation that the Bible was written by men to persuade <coughs> Jews to become Christians, knowing it was a hoax, there are several key things within God's word that simply would not be there. If all these men who wrote the New Testament <clears throat> were in fact trying to convert Jews, in particular in the beginning, to Christianity, why would they write about an unwed mother giving birth to the Savior? There wasn't anything more frowned upon than that idea, the Jews. Remember Joseph there, Matthew chapter 119, he was going to divorce his wife Mary for that cause. And he was trying to do it as a just man, a righteous man, without uh, putting the quote-unquote scarlet letter on her. Why would anyone who wants to convert Jews who look so horribly down, willing to stone those who would fit this category, why would they put that in there? How is it that God would use an unwed mother if not inspired? Jews hated tax collectors. Hated them. These were Rome's men and their own brethren who were commissioned to do this to take their money. It's one thing if it was their own king, like Saul or Solomon or someone like that, but for an enemy who had conquered them to require taxes, that was a whole nother ball of wax. The Jews hated tax collectors. And yet, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 through 13, Jesus called a tax collector to be an apostle. Now, if man was writing this, there is no way. He's letting, and he's trying to bring Jews over to his wants and his religion. He's not saying, man, we're going to have a lot of tax collectors and sinners over here. We're going to have all the people you hate. That's Jews who you hate. That's who we, we want. It's just simply not the case. Rabbis or 
Hebrew teachers. <clears throat> By Jesus' time, they hated anyone with leprosy so much that in their book of tradition, we read that they would not eat an egg if they found out it was sold on the street where a leper lived. They were also taught it was okay to throw rocks at any leper that came what they considered too close to them to keep them away. In other words, the very idea of coming close enough to a leper to touch a leopard was so foreign to any Hebrew teacher that it could not even be fathomed. Like I said, they would throw rocks at them to keep them away. Would not eat any food they knew was bought on the same street where they knew a leopard had lived. And yet in Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, a leper comes to Christ, a rabbi, Hebrew teacher, and he touches him. And heals him. You're not converting Jews as men in men's wisdom. The very people you need to come over are these rabbis. That you need to further your hoax, so to speak. What about the Samaritans? The Jews in general, not just the Pharisees or Sadducees, Zealots, the Jews in general hated the Samaritans so much that they would walk around it. That that little patch of land where the Samaritans were, they would not go through it. In fact, they would cross the Jordan River and, and circle around it to get to the north of the Samaritan land. They hated it so much that they would tell everybody and anybody who listened that that had no part of Judaism in any form or fashion, that that was not Jewish land at all. They said, listen, we're not even going to come near it. Step foot. And yet, the Bible records Jesus talking in John chapter 4, verse 8 to the end, 45, to the Samaritan woman, and not just the Samaritan woman, but to her entire village or town. Not just her. He didn't go around. He went straight through and talked. He didn't run. He didn't leave. God, when we look at his precious word, is that who cannot find anything but inspiration within it. If men wrote it, it would have contradictions. If men wrote it, it wouldn't have the things that are in it. In it. <clears throat> Another thing we learn from the Bible is that <clears throat> it creates faith. The inspired word of God. It creates faith. Not man. Not preaching and teaching of men in any form. But God through his word. What does this word faith mean though? Again, what is it according to the Bible? Now, the word faith has again been transformed and changed to that which is unrecognizable in Scripture, in the Bible. Today, we hear things like, as I heard one man say one time, a religious man called himself a Christian, science takes us so far and then we must take a leap of faith to believe in God. In other words, we get the facts and the evidence and, and everything that science brings, and then when that stops and 
uh, when we can't explain the other stuff, well, that's all God. However, in Scripture, that couldn't be any further from the truth. Faith isn't where facts end. Faith is wholly and completely based on facts. There is no guesswork in it. In fact, if you have a faith that's based on a leap in the dark, you don't have faith. Anyone who has that kind of faith doesn't understand biblical faith at all. The Hebrew writer would declare in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things so forth, the evidence of things not seen. The ESV says it this way, Now faith is the assurance of things so forth, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is that which is based in substance or that which builds assurance and evidence or that which creates conviction. Instead of being a leap in the dark, it's based on facts, logic, and reasoning. In other words, when one has true faith in God, it's because all the evidence points that way. Not because they're hoping it's true or guessing at it. That they're taking some leap but because they know for a fact it's true. You say, well, what do you mean? The faith we read in the Bible about God existing and the faith we need to have in that, Hebrews 11, verse 6, is the same type of faith we have that Abraham Lincoln existed. None of us here have ever seen him, touched him, Smell him, wouldn't want to now anyway. Heard him, there's no recordings of him, no videotape of him. What is there though? A preponderance of evidence that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he exists. In other words, if you know that Abraham Lincoln was a real person in history, then you have faith in that, the type of faith God talks about. That's based on evidence. What about Japan? Has anyone here been to Japan? I haven't. Do you know it exists? How? Because of the facts, the evidence. <clears throat> I've never set foot on it. <clears throat> I've seen a map that someone else drew who told me it exists there. I've looked at the evidence. I've seen the pictures. I've seen, I know it's there, but not because of any of my senses, but because of all the facts and evidence. That same way of looking at that is how God tells us to have faith in him. And it is impossible, Hebrews 11, verse 6, for us to please God without that faith. If our faith is based on a leap in the dark, we don't have faith, we have wishes. And that's not biblical faith. The faith, this faith, is not a miraculous faith. It's not one where God comes down and slaps us on the head and says, this you now know. No, it's a faith that is developed, created. It's a faith that grows not because of wishes and we're wishing it to be true, but because the more we know about God and studying God, the more we realize the facts and truth concerning God and his will. In fact, Paul would say in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The only way one can get faith is through studying the Bible. That's it. I heard the story one time, or read of it, of a man. 
who was in a horrible car wreck. And it was so deadly, he was actually thrown out of the vehicle and was on the side of the road. And one of the uh, people who got on the scene fairly quickly uh, got to that man. He could see he was dying. And he asked the man, he said, have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The man said, I've, I've never stepped foot in a church building. I've never, I've never really studied my Bible. And the, the man who was there said, do you want to go to heaven? He said, well, yeah, I want to. And he says, accept Jesus now. Put your faith in him. And you can go to heaven. The man said, I do. I put my faith in him. I accept him. And the man died. That man didn't have faith. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. He did not hear the word of God. He had never studied about Christ. He never studied what was necessary to obey Christ. Faith isn't what the world says. Bible authority is not just based on biblical inspiration. It's based on true biblical faith that that inspired Bible creates, not man-made imaginations. That's how, as I said, that's how faith matures. It doesn't mature just because we say it does. It doesn't mature just because we go and feed the homeless or we go and, and help widows and orphans. It doesn't mature because of that. Yeah, we feel good for that. We like that in our lives, but faith isn't based on that. Faith is based on God's word. We only mature in our faith, which leads to better faithfulness if we are in the word. If we are learning it more and more, and gaining the wisdom from it. In other words, that we are maturing or further, further developing our faith through study. When the Hebrew writer talked there in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and really through 14 about maturing, he wasn't talking about getting out there and, and feeding the helpless and, and things like that. Yes, we are supposed to do that. What he said was, you've got to get in the Word. If you want your faith to grow, if you want your faith to mature, he says, you've got to study. Not just the milk, but the solid food. Or as Paul would say, present, if we are to be presented to Christ as mature, Colossians 1 and verse 28, it's based on the word. And thanks be to God that you and I have the word the inspired Bible or Word of God. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. In your ability to take in the knowledge of God's Word and apply it to your life to grow wisdom, be mature. The Bible creates faith because it's inspired. And we can easily see the importance that the Bible plays in our faith and how we cannot have faith without it. It being the source of our authority for everything we do, for the faith within us. So again, why is knowing the Bible is inspired and that it creates faith in us and allows us to develop our faith, why is that important? Because of what Colossians 3.17 says. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all or everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If everything we ought to do in our life, every action and every word, 
must be based on the authority of Jesus, who, John 1, 1, is the Word. Then knowing we are secure in our faith based on divine authorship is everything. That we find our authority to do and say what we need to do and say within the divine inspired word that creates faith and faithfulness in our lives. As we go on the rest of these studies, I pray that we understand that first and foremost, that everything we do from this point on in our lives in our walk with God is based on that pure spiritual milk of understanding Bible authority. Understanding the Bible is inspired from God, breathed out by him, and that it creates, that's what creates faith and develops that faith in our lives. This morning, as you reflect upon your faith and walk with God, as you reflect upon your life for him and your desire to live for him, I pray that all is going well and that you are growing in your faith. But if it's the case that you're not, it's easy to grow stagnant or even fall backwards. If that's the case, make the change right now. Don't go throughout those doors this morning without making that change. That means praying to God and allowing him and him alone to help you and you can handle that, then do it. If it means letting us help, then let us help. Let the church hear. Be your strength as well. Let the church here be that encouragement you need to get where you need to be, where your faith ought to be. So this morning, if you need this congregation, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.